Hi, I'm Dr. Bonnie Nish, Executive Director of We're Vancouver. I want to welcome you to our first ever High Bread Festival. We're thrilled this year to be back in person after two long years of being online. We're hopeful that you're going to find the diverse programming that we've set out for you be something that you can find something of enjoyment, something that will educate you, something you can have fun with, bring your family to, bring a book to, and wander around and meet all kinds of authors. We want to also take a moment to thank all those sponsors who make this possible every year. The Canada Arts Council, Canada Book Fund, Canada Periodical Fund, Canada Heritage Fund, BC Gaming, Joseph Walks Foundation, the Hanver Foundation, DVBIA, and so many more. We also want to thank Penguin Random House for coming on board to make sure that we could have ASL interpreters on site this year as well. Please stop by, bring a book, find a book, say hello, and enjoy the day. Hi there, my name is Dave Seaweed, and I'm the Indigenous Coordinator at Douglas College. I am from the Kwakutl Nation, born and raised in East Vancouver. My father and his father before him are from Port Hardy in Alert Bay. I would like to acknowledge that I'm sharing with you today on the Kakite First Nation, which is the newest minster band, and thank Chief Rhonda Larrabee for supporting our work at Douglas College. As is my understanding, the word Vancouver Festival spread throughout the Lower Mainland and Fraser Valley and online throughout North America and beyond. I would also acknowledge the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, Squamish, Kwantlen, Katsi, and Quiquitlam nations. We acknowledge that we are on the unceded traditional territories of the Coast Salish people, where we live, we learn, we play, and we do our work. 95% of British Columbia, including Vancouver, is on unceded traditional First Nations territory. Unceded means that First Nations people never ceded or legally signed away their lands or gave them away to the Crown or to Canada. I have been asked why we acknowledge First Nations territory. Many organizations, governments, and school districts have adopted the practice of acknowledging traditional territories as a way to honor and show respect to the Aboriginal inhabitants of this land, the First Peoples. This practice enables wider municipal communities to share in Aboriginal cultures and leads to better relationships and understandings. Observing this practice connects participants with the traditional territory and provides a welcoming atmosphere to the land where people are gathering. We believe that acknowledging territory is a positive step towards reconciliation, which involves a commitment to learning about and understanding the real history of Canada's Aboriginal peoples and taking responsibility for reconciliation with Aboriginal peoples in Canada. The process of reconciliation is tied to the federal government's relationship with Indigenous peoples. The term has come to describe attempts made by individuals and institutions to raise awareness about colonization and its ongoing effects on Indigenous peoples. I would encourage you all, young and old, to do a little research about where you live, work, or go to school, and in turn, Find out what First Nations territory you are on so you can acknowledge when asked or for sharing at events. I wanted to conclude by mentioning the September 30th national holiday that began last year as National Day for Truth and Reconciliation on September 30th. In First Nations communities, we have been honoring Orange Shirt Day since 2013. The origins for the day come from a story about Phyllis Webstad's experience. She went to the mission for one school year in 73 and 74. She had just turned six years old and lived with her grandmother on the Dog Creek Reserve. They never had very much money, but somehow her grandmother managed to buy her a new outfit to go to the mission school. She remembers going to the store, picking out a shiny orange shirt. It had string laced up in front and was so bright and exciting just like she felt to be going on to school. When she got to the mission, they took away her clothes, including the orange shirt. She never wore it again. She didn't understand why they wouldn't give it back to her. The color orange has always reminded her of that and how her feelings didn't matter, how no one cared and how she felt like she was worth nothing. 
All of the little children were crying and nobody cared. We now wear orange shirts that always say, every child matters. I would encourage you all to wear orange shirts on September 30th and become an ally and partner for First Nations folks dealing with the residential school findings. I'm wishing you all the best during your time with Word Vancouver 2022. Stay strong and stay safe. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Word Vancouver Science Meets Art. You won't have access to your camera or microphone, but you can comment in the comment section. We'll see your comments. And after all four readers have presented, we'll take questions from the comment section. Without you, this free festival couldn't happen. So if you haven't already, please consider making a donation via the link in the chat. You can also um, support Word Vancouver and authors by purchasing books through Iron Dog Books or support the festival through our Adore and Author campaign and silent auction. Today's ECHO panel is co-sponsored by the Federation of BC Writers, so I'd like to introduce Katie Wagner, co-chair of the Federation Board of Directors, to say a few words. Hi, thank you, um, Cynthia, and thank you to Word um, Vancouver Festival. I, I am here speaking on behalf of the Federation of, of BC Writers, representing all writers in um, British Columbia. Um, and I've been personally a member of the FBCW for more, well over a decade. Um, and I started out as an area rep for the Maple Ridge Pit Meadows um, area. And I've now been two years on the board and recently elected as co-chair. And thinking about what I've gotten from being a member, I think there's three main things. Um, one is being part of a community, which for me as a writer is really important. You know, so much of what we do is, is done alone and in isolation in our in our you know writing area or writing cave whatever you want to call it um, but community and connection with other writers is so important um, you know that that support and um, that feeling that you're not alone uh, also learning um, for me writing is a continuous learning journey and I get so much out of um, uh, workshops and talking to other writers, events where we can interact. So yeah, for me, the, the, there's three big um, uh, benefits of membership, uh, community connection and learning. Uh, and just to give you a little bit of an idea of the, of the type of um, uh, programming and services we offer, um, I would invite you to go to our website at um, bcwriters.ca. It's chock full of information about who and what we are. Um, and really, we have something for writers in every genre and stage of development. Um, we don't consider ourselves an organization that only serves one sector. Um, we welcome everybody from beginners to multi-published uh, veterans and everyone in between. Uh, we run an annual summit conference, which has been um, virtual the last couple of years, like everyone else. And uh, that's in May. And then we do a mini summit in November. We run a series of um, Sunday webinars. The next one coming up is What Teens Want from YA Literature. Uh, there's an annual contest. We're going to be putting out anthologies related to that. We have regular um, emails and newsletters. Uh, there's, we feature writer for profiles and do advocacy on behalf of, of British Columbia writers. Um, there's a Wise Words program that's mainly aimed, aimed at senior writers uh, and a Recommend a Book program that's just starting where, where um, Federation of BC Writer members can nominate the book and write a, you know, a, a little review of the book of another member uh, to you know give us all a little bit more um, profile. 
And if you go on our website, you will see Creative Sparks, which is which are weekly writing prompts from prominent writers and, and others in the community. Um, so yeah, I invite you to come and check us out and, and um, we're really happy to be part of this event. Thank you. Thank you so much, KT. And our four readers today are members of the Federation of BC Writers. I'm going to let you know about everyone. I'll read all their bios first, let you know about them, and then we'll hear from each poet individually. So our first poet he'll be presenting is writer, editor, teacher, and obviously poet, Yvonne Blomer. She's the author of The Last Show on Earth from Caitlin Press 2022, which is her fourth book of poems, and the travel memoir, Sugar Ride, Cycling from Hanoi to KL, which explores body, time, and memory. Yvonne is the editor of two water anthologies, Refugium, Homes for the Pacific, and Sweet Water, Poems for the Watersheds, both published by Caitlin Press. She holds an MA in Creative Writing, Poetry with Distinction from the University of East Anglia. From 2015 to 2018, she was the Poet Laureate for the City of Victoria. And from 2009 to 2015, she ran the weekly reading series, Planet Earth Poetry. You can find her at yvonneblomer.com. Yvonne lives on the traditional territories of the Saanich, Sanhis, and Esquimalt peoples of the Coast Salish Nation. Um, after Leanne reads, we'll be hearing from Leanne Boschman, who is a Vancouver Island-based writer living and working on the, in the Cowichan territory. Her poetry has been published in Geese Magazine, Prism International, Other Voices, Dandelion Magazine, Room, Art Poetry, and Grain. As well, her poems have been published in several anthologies. Her collection, Precipitous Signs, a Rain Journal, was published by Leaf Press in 2009. In it, she explores colonial narratives of settlement and the lived experience of women in labor markets and domestic settings. Leanne completed her PhD in the Languages, Cultures, and Literacies program at SFU and has collaborated as a curriculum designer and educator in several BC communities. She presently works with adult learners in the First Nations community on Vancouver Island. Her second collection of poems is entitled Here at the Crux, um, which just came out in 2022 and which she'll be reading from today. We'll also hear from Joanna Lilly from her fifth book and third poetry collection, Endlings, which was published by Turnstone Press in 2020 and won the Fred Kerner Book Award. Joanna is also the author of a novel, Worry Stones, from Ronsdale Press, which was long listed for the Caledonia Novel Award, and a short story collection, The Birthday Book. Joanna's other poetry collections are If There Were Roads, The Fleece, and The Fleece, sorry. Um, in 2021, Joanna won the, Borea the Borealis Prize, the Commissioner of Yukon Award for Literary Contribution. A Humber School for Writers graduate, she has won an MLit degree in creative writing from the Universities of Glasgow and Strathclyde and diplomas in journalism and plain language editing. I'm always blown away by all these people's accomplishments. I'm born in the south of England, Joanna lived in Wales and Scotland before moving to Canada and has given readings and workshops from as far away as Alaska and Iceland. She's now joining us from Whitehorse in the Yukon, where she's a founding member of Yukon Words and is grateful to reside on the traditional territories of the Kwamundun First Nation and the Tian Quachian Council. And our fourth reader today is Renee Sarajoni Saklakar, a poet and lawyer who lives in Vancouver on the unceded traditional territories of the Coast Salish people. Her work appears in many journals and anthologies. She's the author of four books, including the groundbreaking poetry book, Children of Air India, about the bombing of Air India Flight 182, which won the Canadian Authors Association Poetry Prize. 
and she's the co-author with Dr. Mark Winston of the Poetry and Essay Collection, Listening to the Bees, winner of the 2019 Gold Medal Independent Publishers Award for Environment and Ecology. Her work has been adapted for visual art, dance, and opera, including Air India Redacted, with SFU Woodward's The Irish Arts Council, and Turning Point Ensemble. Renee Saragini, Saragini served as the inaugural Poet Laureate for the City of Surrey from 2015 to 2018, and she teaches creative writing as well as law and ethics for writers and editors. She curates lunch poems at SFU and the Vancouver Poetry Phone and is a member of Meet the Press's Collective. She serves on the advisory board of Events Magazine as well. She also serves as a board, of, as a board director for the Surrey International Writers Festival and Poetry in Canada. Renee works the epic, reclaiming it for climate justice and female heroes in her lawn project, Thought J. Bap, The Heart of This Journey Bears All Patterns, an epic fantasy in verse. The book we'll be hearing from today is the first in her, in her series, is Brahma and the Beggar Boy from Nightwood Editions. So we're going to open hearing from um, Yvonne Blomer from her latest book. And I'm muted. Thank you so much, Cynthia, for that wonderful introduction for all of us. I'm really delighted to be here. Um, thanks to Word Vancouver, the Federation of BC Writers, and also to poets who are writing about climate um, everywhere, and in particular today, the four of us. I'm going to read three poems from The Last Show on Earth, which um, contains I'm going to start with the title poem, or the poem that contains the title, and it's inspired by this painting by Robert Bateman. And it also set up the kind of one of the threads through the book, which is that of a circus. And circuses, in a sense, at their height, existed in a way to distract people from what was going on. And I think... Um, we have a lot of things that we use to distract us from what's going on now as well. And in circuses, there are diverse people, there are aging trains, and there are abused animals. And the last show on earth, um, the book has those things in it as well. So here's the poem, Circus Moon, Circus Train, after Robert Bateman's Circus Train Nighthawks. Candy wrapper moon, split winged hawks, circus train. A dragon, silver and gold scaled its lashing tail. How tent and train drew coin from candy flossed hands, teased in by popcorn's buttery scent. This beast once chuntered across borders. Now the moon and opening in night where blue, gray puce seep in. Here and then gone, a shadow, a species moving on a field you see and look for again. Faithful swaying servant, rolling, articulated. It carried animals and humans. Mover of low moans and quick laughter, every rail and tie a rehearsal for the last show on earth. Waning moon, night stilled hawk, broken spined serpent, the oiled skin and painted smiles of ballerina, clown, strong man, shine through, ghost shapes in splintered shafts. Light on this reptilian ride. Absence of whistle on a field where a kid stands. Frayed jeans, eyes roll to sky as puffed breath moves on wind. Luminous, empty moon, feral moon. Night's coming, coming in. The next poem I'm going to read, I wrote 
for an event when I was a poet laureate, and the event was Canada Day, and uh, it was 2015, so the Harper government was still in power in Canada, and for me that meant that in many ways scientists were being silenced, and I felt that artists really needed to speak out about things. And I agreed to read on Canada Day and then was quite concerned about having agreed to do that. So this is the poem I wrote. Water and Weeds. I am the woman sitting in her back garden, contemplating drought and weeds. When I begin to write, I want the lines of a poem to be the small pebble that drops to the water's depths. Sometimes instead, a black feather weightless and floating. Sometimes a child's chalk candy dissolving. If we are happy, let it bowl us over. If we are lost, let's find the shore. Tonight, music and fireworks, a date the many years, the immigrants, those who have come, who have stayed, those whose ancient ancestors wait in the shadows of long fallen totems, call on the brave to again be brave. I have been reading Thomas King and Virginia Woolf. I have been imagining the very words and the earth they rise from, how I too come from these places. I have been laughing, carefully teaching our son how to hang laundry on the line, cold water, clean soap, and for a stain, the sun's light to bleach. I am barefoot in my garden. I am standing in the uncertain mist of history, hoping to slow the world down. I will touch your hand, repeat your name to remember it. Language is alive in a poem, memory in a word. I am a woman standing on the shores of the great Pacific. I am reaching out my arms, ready to learn the first words of this land, holding hope as I walk my feet into the jagged tide. And since we're near the Pacific in that poem, I'll stay on the Pacific (laughs) with my last poem which is called Fog Grays Harbor. And this poem comes out of an experience in Washington State in Grays Harbor, where we had driven from Whistler, which had 36 degrees Celsius heat, down to Grays Harbor, which was more like foggy and 18 degrees one summer. We walk when the sun and earth move again, when the long grasses bellow the horn song. Damp fingers stroke me, I dip and bob, am coated in spray by cloud and the breath of sea lions, the breath of the deep sea skates. Forgetting is remembering in reverse. Along the coast, I dance and skip, I lie still, I slip beneath waves of fog, feathers of fog. To desire is to forget everything, To desire is fog, salted breath on skin, flesh, and the tides of flesh. When I said her broken wing, I meant turn back. I meant the disjointed clouds. I meant the tide has pulled me out. I meant the island. All day we walked toward the island. With each step, what we remembered vanished. The motor homes and trucks, the dogs and fishermen, we followed the tide it vanished. What shadows? All day, the last traces of light stolen by the sea. Why care anyway? All day, I waited for the sound of the horn. I fanned the sharp grasses. I watched the ragged masts grown from the sea vanish and the perfect heron shadows. I saw the fragile purple flowers, their shallow roots saw the carapace of skate egg and mistook it for kelp. I dipped my hand and drank from the sea. I dipped and drank fog. I drew breath or water into gills. I listened for what spills from this tipping earth. Thank you so much for listening. 
Thank you so much, Yvonne, for such a beautiful, luminous reading and for your wisdom. I'm so moved by the imagery of holding on to hope. Oh, yes. Um, uh, what's the significance of slowing down in relation to climate change? Well, I think we really saw that in that first year of the pandemic when we all kind of stopped for a little while. If humans slow down a bit, it gives the earth a little bit of a chance and all the other creatures on the earth. And I think our rapid growth and development is really hard on all the other creatures that we share the planet with. So, so I think in that large sense of slowing down, and I think in a personal sense of slowing down, we're, you know, we push ourselves quite hard sometimes. And I think slowing down allows an attachment to the rhythms of the natural world as well. Thanks so much. Our next reader will hear from Leanne Washman. Thank you, Cynthia, for putting this panel together. And um, thanks to Word Vancouver and to the BC Federation of Writers. I'm going to read the uh, poem that the title of the book um, here at the Crux is uh, uh, taken from. And here we go. That night, I heard the wheeze of the dying season at the window pane of the small classroom. Professor H's voice was unspooling in American lit class, his tweed jacket, jacket baggy and his gray ponytail wriggling over his collar down his back. Our textbooks lay open, a few centuries of words, heavy in spite of the flimsy pages on which most students added only light pencil marks hoping to resell them. Sometimes my mind wandered out to the edges of the city into bluffs where my mother planned to pick rose hips the next day or return to the kitchen where I had helped her with canning that afternoon, choice fruit brought back from the Okanagan by some neighbor, but she could make the best of runty crab apples or choke cherries. As we discussed imagery and symbolism, I thought how simple her creations, fruit, water, sugar, thickened with pectin, those jars lined up on the counter, inside peaches suspended with small hollows where the pits had been, syrup turned to amber in the scant light of the range hood. Gardens and fields had br recently brimmed over where less than a century ago dust smothered the hopes of our grandparents. I watched the tip of Professor H's cigarette glow, tried to guess if sparks would fall before he could flick them into the portable ashtray with its checkered beanbag base, which he routinely set on the desk before he started the class. He was flapping his arms around more than usual, a slight hunch to his back as he paced. We were discussing the grapes of wrath, jostling to catch the questions he tossed at us. When he read the last scene aloud, Rosa Sharn, her baby dead, offering her milk to the starving man, the guys smirked and young women blushed, glanced downwards. I wondered at the very idea of that emaciated man looking up at me like that. The shadowed craters of his face imagined the cracked lips and is taking me into his dry mouth, needing me to live. Silence after Professor H stopped reading, all hoping he wouldn't ask us to comment, but he stared down at the page, suddenly slumped and began to sob. Finally, he managed to say that mythology was powerful, but it wouldn't change anything if we couldn't grasp it. Shakily, he lit another cigarette, said his family was convinced he was having a midlife crisis. Someone raised their hand, politely asked if that were true. He laughed and matter-of-factly said, no, I've probably always been batshit crazy. But when my students now sneak glances at their cell phones or drift into laptop screens, at times I too want to cry. Every day more stories of desperate migrants, floods and wildfires. My mother's ashes settling in a distant plot, her yellowing recipe cards rarely taken out of the metal box at the back of a cupboard. Grief here at the crux of my life, where it could all go down in cinders and soot dust piling up on window ledges again. 
This next poem that I'd like to read is called Springtime Diary 2022. And it was written uh, at the beginning of the, the war in Ukraine, thinking about different connections, but def definitely from an environmental perspective, just the, the, the ravages on the environment and the kind of green recovery that's going to be needed, but, but also opportunities, I think, um, in, in our awareness of, of uh, energy use and, and connections as well. So in late February, buds are still brown nodes on tree branches. A few weeks later, witness the opening of these solar collectors, vital oxygen factories. They are small green flags unfurled, their only anthem, breathe, breathe, breath is sacred. Recall homely flower bulbs planted in fall, their peeling brown papery tunics. Marvel that they hold within them the parrot and rainbow tulips. Now in March, they are variegated clusters commingling. In springtime, sift the soil, witness Earth's ceaseless diurnal cycle, the web of fungi, protozoa, and microanthropoids. Find evidence of earthworm labor, burrowing, composting. See the bent necks of germinating seeds, how they invoke a benediction of sunlight and rain. And just when all this growth seems unstoppable, a storm unleashes sleet, shivers crocuses with snow. Like the ravages of war, tyrant winds threaten to blight our leafy hopes. Even while many of us are ready to restore this earth, pocked and poisoned by battles, wielding only plowshares and pruning hooks, we long to make scorched ground flourish. And for um, a last part of my reading, I'm going to just read the last two sections of Morning Fog, the last poem of the collection. These mornings, I wonder what I am inside this fog. What part of me is fog? Part of me is fog, call it breath, patience, threshold. Fog whispers, here is your answer. Hear how particles of prayers hover. What I am making of my soul, a first shearing lamb's wool, winding a skein, knowing all you've gathered will be unraveled. Tiny glass seed beads of light on the lake, each sequin gesture towards love, pure shearling, sacred, undyed, yearning to be tinged by prismatic devotion. Troubles of this world pass, the rowers soon out of sight. What is left is this soul-shaping artisanship of liquid stratus hovering over the lake at this dew point of my day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leanne. There's an innate sense of peace that permeates even your toughest imagery, even here at the crux. What does being at the crux mean to you? Hmm. It's, it's a, a strong word for me, and, and it has a few meanings that really resonate. Um, and, and definitely there's a sense of, of a difficult problem, of, of uh, undeniable losses, of urgency, of, of uh, climate scientists telling us that, that we're at this point. You know, we can still avert uh, disaster. We have a chance to, to make a difference. And, and the crux can be, has intersections with where we're at in our own life, you know. Um, and, and the line for me was grief here at the crux of my life, but just, just a sense of not being paralyzed by that, but taking time to, to examine it and, and, and to move forward. So where do you find hope in these transitions? Where do you find your sense of hope to go forward? Mm, hope. Uh, well, definitely, I, I find hope in gardening and just witnessing regeneration. I, I, I'm doing more of it because it gives me hope. It, it brings me in closer connection with, with the cycles of, of nature and, and earth. Um, definitely all those miracles living in such a beautiful region here on, on the uh, unceded traditional territories of the Cowichan tribes and Malahat nation and, and hope in, in reconciliation in that I think we're, we're starting 
to you know learn more um, and respect the the traditional knowledge of indigenous peoples and and hope in in what I see in younger generations in in my own children and grandchildren that they're making significant shifts in their lives and that even very young children preschool children can be aware of of um, you know, making changes without being anxious, but puzzling, inventing, creating, you know, in their play, they're, they are aware of the imperatives. And yeah, so I I'm, I'm marvel at, at their, their knowledge and, and the actions that they're taking. Thank you so much. Your beautiful words, your beautiful message and the sense of peace you bring to everything that you do. Thank you so, Thank you so much. So the next poet we'll be hearing from is Joanna Lilly um, from her new book, Endlings. Hi there, thank you so much. It's um, so amazing. I'm here in Whitehorse up in Yukon. Uh, so north of, of most of you, I feel, and it's just such a privilege to be able to be part of this um, from far away. So thank you to Word Vancouver and the Federation as well. So I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna read some poems, three poems from my book, Endlings. Um, it's all about extinct species. Um, and the first poem I'm going to read is about the Tasmanian tiger, also known as the thylacine. And um, the last thylacine became extinct. The last one died um, in 1936 in Hobart Zoo. And they were persecuted. Um, people thought that they were killing sheep. And there was sort of a lot of propaganda against them. Um, and then it was sort of eventually realized too late that their jaws were not actually strong enough to... to kill sheep. Anyway, I'm giving too much detail. Um, we can maybe talk about research later on. So this poem is called If Rain Touched Me. And it's from the point of view of an imaginary thylacine. The fence post is a broad white blur. Grass flickers in the foreground. You know what you're looking at. You can't stop watching. You wish I were in focus. You'd see for certain if I was limping. You're looking at my tail and thinking I'm a fox. I must be, because I've been dead for decades. Yet foxes don't have a big head like this, or a long straight tail like this, or stripes, or a hopping gait. It's a limp, or else I'm more kangaroo than fox, more kangaroo than tiger. You've given me so many names. The first of you ate me, then covered my bones with stones. If rain touched me, you believed bad weather would come. The second of you shot me and chopped off my head for a dollar. You made me wolf, a scapegoat for the sheep you killed. Is it me in that blurry film? Why would I come within video range? Why did you want me dead so many times, yet now you aim your camera to shoot me alive? So the next poem I'm going to read is about the ivory-billed woodpecker, which was a magnificent, very large uh, wood, black and white woodpecker with a red crest. And um, a lot of people refuse to believe that the ivory-billed uh, woodpecker is absolute, absolute, actually extinct. And even in 2005, there were um, expeditions to try and find evidence. And there, if you look online, it's fascinating because there's videos and audio and people convinced it's the woodpecker and others convinced it isn't. Um, okay, this is called Rewind. As if looking can force feathers into wingspan, into a flap of broad white trailing black between flared cypress boles rising to bayou green. As if sloshing paddles, heaving water, waiting can slap the double knock of a beak on wood into a microphone fixed to a canoe. Watch the flight online again. Press stop to bring the bird back. Reverse 11 wing beats to the first fuzzy push from bark to air. One bill was worth three buckskins as far away as Canada. Jewels for a warrior's crown. Beaks split to click together on a belt. Red head tufts ripped to wrap a pipe. Watch the flight once more. Donate to save more hardwood habitat. Consider driving to Arkansas, renting a canoe and sitting, looking, listening, paddle dripping. 
And the last poem um, is one of the poems in the book, which isn't about a specific species. Uh, most of them are. And this one is called, It's Time to Talk of Hope. It's time to talk of human evolution with a tapered blue mug of Earl Grey and a slice of spelt toast while my dog rests her head on your feet and your dog lies behind me watching through the window for a yellow car. Sapiens are still becoming, we agree. Evolution never stops, of course, as long as moon and earth twist in locked rotation around an ending sun. Perhaps we can delay our inevitable extinction by persuading our DNA into a kinder transmutation. Perhaps we can augment our aptitude for wonder. In a single solar orbit, we discovered the existence of another 18,000 species. A Tinkerbell fairy fly fits four times inside a millimeter. A koala's fingerprints are the same as ours. A starfish losing an arm will grow another. Let us practice our amazement in case it saves us. Let us bend to count a slug's four noses instead of drowning it in a plastic pot of beer. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Joanna. And especially for that message, it's time to talk of hope. Mm -hmm. That's so important as a philosophy. Um, Endlings is a formidable marriage of art and science. The poet, you've given us the message of our, our ignorance contributing to extinction. It's tangible and heartbreaking. But this book obviously took a lot of research as well as emotion. How much research went into it? A lot, yes. Um, um, but in a very kind of, you know, I had a plan and then I changed my plan all the time. Um, and I'm not a scientist in any sense of the word, so it was quite intimidating. And when you said marriage of, you know, art and uh, poetry and science, it kind of makes me feel terrified. because I, I still worry that someone's going to email me and say, you, you know, you got all this wrong and that sort of thing. Anyway, um, yes, a lot of research, um, a lot of it online, of course. Uh, there's amazing videos of the Tasmanian tiger. Um, on YouTube, that sort of thing. But I was also lucky enough pre-pandemic to get funding to go to some natural history museums, uh, which was amazing. So, you know, in Washington and New York and so on. So I was able to actually meet meet the fossils and the, the sort of stuffed taxidermied creatures. And that was, that was really powerful, actually, and, and a massive privilege that even then I knew it was. And obviously with the pandemic, even more so that I was able to roam around. And I went to zoos as well. And looked at animals, you know, the, who were potentially related to species I was writing about. Yeah. And then, yeah, books and all the all the usual things. Very grateful to a lot of people who put things on websites. Yeah. Your work is so inspirational and informative. I'm wondering, what, what do you see as the role of echo poetry in influencing our mindsets and behavior? I think it's, I mean, for me, it was a necessity um, to write this, some, I mean, that sounds a bit artistic and melodramatic, but it, you know, I've always, I've, I've cared deeply about animals my whole life. So to write this was just wonderful and obviously very heartbreaking, but wonderful to be able to create something out of all that grief and sadness. Um, but also what I'm really interested in is that extinction is very natural. So yes, humans have um, um, excelled, um, that's not the right word, the rate of extinction rapidly, something like up to 10,000 times, but 99% of every creature who's ever existed has become extinct. So extinction is natural. So I, a lot, half the poems in the book are actually about species who, when it was not our fault that they went extinct, because I wanted to look into that too and try and kind of go back and hear their voices and, and connect with them. Yeah. So what is the main message of endlings? And your main message as an echo? Gosh, that's a good question. Um, I think I suppose it's just pay attention, really, and appreciate. And I think in Canada, um, if I dare say this, it's a sweeping generalization, um, but we have a lot of amazing, big, beautiful, charismatic creatures. Yeah, we have bears and moose and those sort of things. I'm from the UK, where the larger mammals have all gone. Um, there are deer and there are badgers and so on. Um, and there's a huge attention in Britain on the tiniest species, you know, little woodlands, 
protected to preserve a butterfly or a, a something we can't even see. So I just, I would like there to be a warning maybe to Canada to take more care. We have so much landscape and let's please just try and, and protect that. Yeah. That was not one sentence. Sorry, that was a whole long paragraph. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Thank, thank you very you much. Me. Thank you. For your reading, your wisdom, and your gift of hope. Thank you so much. So now we're going to hear from Renee Saragini Saklikar. Hello. Welcome. Thank you. I guess I will start reading now and get my work up on the screen and just let me know if there's any trouble hearing me. One afternoon, after the dry and in the wet, in an old house in an abandoned village on the outskirts of Perimeter, in the place they call Pacifica, Brahma and the beggar boy find fragments of an ancient text in an oak box and hunched over scraps of parchment and broken computer disks, they blow the dust off a cover. And so our story begins. So welcome to this world of Brahma and the beggar boy, an epic fantasy and verse governed by accelerated climate change, an all powerful global industrial complex consortium. And it's a world ravaged by pandemics, climate catastrophes and global inequity and inequality. Shape-shifting in and out of all of it is the locksmith, Brahma, a locksmith who is brown, brave, and beautiful, and she's joining the resistance, helping orphans and seed savers in this ravaged planet. I'm just reading a few selected poems to give you a flavor of all of this. It's a very long book, and it's only book one, so just a few this afternoon. I think we're heading into the afternoon now. Gratitude to all the poets, to Word Vancouver, to Iron Dogs, to all of you who are here, Iron Dog Bookstore, to all of you who are here, and to our wonderful host and tech. The Five Catastrophes. By water, the soul, tsunami, seepage, cascading, eroded, by fire, the eyes, scorched, singed, blasted, burned to melt, the earth, by the body trembling, split, collapsed on knees, tumbled and crushed by wind, the voice. Blown, sifting syllables, winnowed circumference, made square by four, ripped, torn, worn, howl. It were the battle of Kingsway and after. So that's just the opening. Captured at the gates, the last of the autumn portals. Settlers, migrants, chained, we sang. Before is also a place. Transport planes to buses, freight trains, shunting, railway tracks, bombed, rebuilt, old iron. Dry pine cones fell unrelenting and sad. Baghdad to Paris, east to west, reserve armies of labor, social unrest. The poorest families, sick with fever, who stood at the back of the line, shared crusts of bread, telling tales of the before. At the year's midnight, we sighed, heads bent to perimeter, where oracles foretold colony collapse. Our aunties saving mason bees, small finds in handmade glass jars, Wildfires in November, ash mixed with ice, our skin dry and cracked scalps covered in mice. Gray skies unending, snow drought extending, sallow leaves withering, their spines snapped in two. A tower juniper, we settlers, migrants, stood before rentalsmen ready to accept payment for shelter. We bartered our daughters. We sold our boys, Wi-Fi and ration, our androids, no toys. Toxic alert on high, we ached for green. Who would have thought of us standing unseen? Overheard by seed savers. Mind those drones, they'll break your bones. Hide and sweep, duck and swerve, watch us learn. These raindrops burn. 
Women gossip to the seed savers about Brahma the locksmith. At Tower Juniper, they talked about her name. Some said Brahma, others said Brahma. She had apprenticed to the godfather of locksmiths, Joseph P. Brahma. Our bread set to rise, they said, but falling flat, oven door banging, unhinged and broken, all that heat lost. At Cedar Cottage, they said, our milk soured, wood cracked, the butter wouldn't set, and then a black cat ran under the ladder. At Hemlock Place, that dog next door wouldn't stop barking. Look, our keys broken inside their locks, stuck. Well, consortium said they'd send someone at the commons gathered in a circle. In unison, they said, about Brahma, the locksmith. Her fingers brown and strong, smooth leather satchel. Her black braid shining, pip and file drill, tweezers lock, and a ghost key pulled out one by one these tools gleaming in the sun. She worked fast, all the while her lips moving. Let all evil die and the good endure. The beggar boy meets Brahma's grandmother. When Brahma brought the boy to grandmother, they both laughed. Not another one to feed. Oh, well, said grandmother, shaking her head. Come with me, boy. You can help carry seeds. One night, they walked past that carved portal gate. Grandmother took the boy's hand and shook sequoia seeds, kernels, red dawn, swirls, hard spindle shape. These seeds, as thin as oatmeal flakes, fluttered down. With the seeds, a set of tales found in an old oak box, written on parchment fragments, read aloud by Brahma to the beggar boy. The notes of the beekeeper's daughter. They burnt all our hives. They killed my mother with her last breath. She made me write these down, these notes. She taught us edge magic, twilight and dusk, dawn or the hours just before tilted entry points, lines, horizons opening. We raced to the west to time the sunset. We kneeled eastward, even when overcast. She told us to spin, turn, counted centers, the gap between thumb and index sextant. In silence or in song, we stepped forward, daughters of the light. Data as coda. We counted 11 honey locusts, branches thickened with moss, six bird nests, omens, forget me not. The bees long tongued, the distance between or short tongued, not quite reaching the bloom's last seen on Coquitsia amabilis, signals of distress when blooming. We found one seed saver left, unnamed, marginal, and soon to be struck from the record forever, alone in her condo out by the goodbye river, woman chair bound, reaching for cardamom, saffron threads mixed with street harvests, Meta Sequoia imports now banned, her brown hands trembling. Thank you so much, Renee. I love the soothing nature of lyricism and hope that permeates Brahma and the Baker Boy. What inspired you to tackle climate change in this way? I think like most of us, um, really observing and noticing how things are going, especially in this pandemic. Um, drought, floods, fires, heat domes, these cycles of extreme weather and disappearing species, all the things, and then layered into that, the inequities of our world and the way that inequality makes the effects of climate change worse for all species and all of the planet. So somehow this idea came to me about what would happen next 
if accelerated climate change continues and all of that, that thinking merged with how poetry comes to me, which isn't about thinking at all. It's about listening to sounds and rhythms. Yeah, like that. So grateful by immortalizing our concerns and hope in a poem. I think you've given us something so much more. You've given us the information that we need and something beyond it so that you're reaching us both emotionally and intellectually, all of the poets here today, which I think is really what's needed for the world today. I'm so grateful. We have time for questions from the audience if anyone would like to ask a question to either of our poet, to any of our poets. And um, I just, um, I also want to ask Renee really quickly, what is your main message as an echo poet? Well, as a poet, I don't know that I focus on messages. Certainly the themes of accelerated climate change, global inequity, are very prevalent, but so is, as you can hear, rhyme as a kind of subversive medium, uh, even amongst the most serious of poems. I think a main message for hope in the middle of this planetary despair is what I observe in makers, in craftspeople, which I consider myself humbly always as a beginner, always, no matter how many books published, I have the fifth book coming out, which is the second in the series, and this sense of making, less thinking, less agitation in doing, and more being and receiving and noticing. And so our resistance, resistance is informed by compassion and making to be the maker. Thank you so much. I'm just gonna open the floor at the last two to four minutes here. If any of the panelists have any comments for each other, um, feel free to just jump in. And if not, I have more questions for you all. <laughs> I just was noting that certain things seem to come up in all our poems and really, really kind of reveling in that and finding wonderment there. So that was quite lovely. Yeah, I, I, the same thing, I, I, um, the same uh, kind of observation that there are all these threads and that it was a really a, a beautiful um, kind of tapestry here that was being woven today and uh, yeah, just wanting to echo the hope and um, the, 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 both the, the, the parts that are troubling and, and, you know, resonating with that, but, but also the hopefulness as well. I think in a sense, I think Renee just almost or said something very similar that the act of writing or creating is a call to the future. And I feel that as how I hold how I hold hope is I, I keep calling to the future. <laughs> what else can we do? <laughs> yeah. One of the reasons I chose all of you and love all your work so much is that while you're being absolutely honest and scientific, you're also infusing us with hope and peace. You all have a beautiful sense of peace, I find, that comes into our bodies and souls and, and work. And I think that's the most important thing we can offer right now. In addition to your absolute honesty, you're not afraid to go right up to the truth and meet it and share it and and carry it, but you also do it with um, peace and hope and beautiful lyricism. But it's so much gratitude to all of you for reading with us today. So much gratitude to Word Vancouver, the Federation of BC Writers for sponsoring the event today. Um, you can buy books at Iron Dog Books. And <laughs> going from memory because my computer with my notes disappeared, but just want to thank everyone so much. Thanks to Word Vancouver. Thank you to our beautiful audience. There are tons of comments in the chat room that I hope that all of our readers get to um, see. And um, just thank you so much to everyone. Thank you to Word Vancouver for hosting us. Thanks for coming out to Science Meets Art. Thanks so much, Cynthia. Yeah. It's been a lovely hosting. Yeah. It's lovely to connect with you all online, listening and reading. Mm -hmm. Yeah, lovely. Thank you, Cynthia, so much for your work on today. It was wonderful. Thanks, everyone, and goodbye. Yeah. And remember to check out the rest of the Word Vancouver Festival. There are yeah. lots and lots of wonderful panels.